Let's pray. Father, we're here to talk about living by faith in future grace, and so I ask for that now, for me, that I would trust you for three hours worth of future grace, and that it would come with power, with wisdom, with humility, with courage, that it would strip away all fear of man and all self-exaltation, and it would abound with memory of the precious things in the Word of God and in the history of the world with the cross at its center. And for those who are here in this room and for those who are watching, I pray also for future grace for some for the next five minutes before they turn it off, and for others the whole time. Lord, there will be no understanding, there'll be no grasping, there'll be no embracing or cherishing or treasuring if your grace does not come. And so we ask for it because you said, ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened. So we're asking and seeking and knocking. We're not blundering ahead with any sense of self-sufficiency or self-reliance in this moment. We are casting ourselves now upon you for your sustaining of the technology, which is the least important, and your sustaining of our faith, which is the most important, and our lives. So I pray now that you'd come and do all of that for the glory of Jesus in his name, I pray, amen. Thank you so much for coming, some of you from far away. If you've come from out of town, why don't you raise your hand, just see. Has anybody else left? I mean, if you didn't, if you didn't raise your hand, raise your hand. I don't know if that, I think that's probably a first. So more people from out of town, thank you so much for, for doing that. Uh, some of you come a long way and some of you are celebrating some important things this weekend I heard about. So that's great, I'm tickled that you're here. My mom used to say that, tickled, I was like, why would she say that? Um, we're all governed in large measure by our experience in the way our theology develops, and we just should be honest about that. None of us is dropped down into the world with no cultural, no background, no family, no personality, no pain, no fear, no nothing influencing us, just raw Bible. No, it doesn't happen to anybody. So we're born into a family, we, we grow up, we have personalities that are a problem to us and, and, uh, and we experience amazing painful and happy things, all of them affecting what we long for and what you long for, it tends to be what you see in the Bible. So I was just being honest that this seminar is shaped hugely by my inadequacies. I grew up a very fearful boy, couldn't talk in front of a group till I was about 20. I mean, couldn't, 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 not funny, not like butterflies and weak knees. Everybody laughs about kids who can't, you know, they get nervous, baloney, it's not funny. It wasn't funny. To this day, it wasn't funny. My, my mom took me to a psychologist who tried to blame it on her, so I never went back because she was the only one who understood and would cry with me at night about civics book reports I was supposed to give and couldn't give and therefore had to take a C in class. So if you grew up like that, what would you look for in the Bible? <laughs> Help, courage, fearlessness, some way to be able to do it, right? So just know I'm after help in the Bible. And that wasn't my only problem. So. 
Uh, living by faith in future grace is a way of life that I think is completely, totally biblical. Why would you embrace a view of life that you thought was helpful and was going to damn you in the end because it wasn't biblical? Not me. I'm really eager to go to heaven. Another desire I had as a kid was not to go to hell. I still have it. And, and therefore, I'm looking for the truth. I want to know God. I don't play any games with anybody's ideas. I just want to know God. You tell me, God, what to believe, I'll believe it. Because you matter more than anything. So, living by faith in future grace has roots. And I hope they are refined by, shaped by the Bible. That's what all these slides are going to be, is 90% Bible that I have here in front of me. Another way to describe the seminar, you could call it um, a seminar on sanctification. So there's justification whereby God declares us righteous and perfect because of our union with Christ through faith alone in Jesus Christ on the basis of his work. That's justification, the foundation, and then built on that and happening over a lifetime is this thing called sanctification, whereby we, through the Spirit, by the Word, and I'm going to argue by faith in future grace, are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next into the image of Christ. I'm 66. I want more. I want to be more like Christ tomorrow than I am today. I want to be a better husband next year than I am now. I'm not done, will never be done. A little flavor, maybe, of, of future grace. I count everything as loss. You know where this is coming from. This is Philippians 3. I count everything as loss for the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from law, but the righteousness that comes through faith, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, if by any means possible I might attain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, nor am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because he has made me his own. This is my image, okay? This is one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. That's Philippians 3.12. I press on to make it my own. Oh, you do? Who's you? Because he has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on for the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. If you understand that text, you give future grace. I press on. I strain forward, I reach out because I've been reached. Now, just, just a little more comment on that. <laughs> when I say, because he made me his own, I press on to make the resurrection and full fellowship with Jesus in the age to come, I press on to make that my own because he has made me already his own. Where's faith in future grace? Aren't you keying off of the, he made me his own? At this point, 
I'm, I'm going to press you at every moment into the meaning of things. What does it mean to be thrilled by he made me his own? What does that mean? Like, oh, 2,000 years ago, he paid for my sins. He canceled the wrath of God. He opened the doors of heaven. He shut the doors of hell. Nothing to do with our relationship today. Nothing to do with whether he'll show up tomorrow and help me. Wrong. I don't give a rip what happened on the cross if it makes no difference for tomorrow. Let us eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Unless when he made me his own, I'm still his own. And tomorrow I will be his own. And if that's not true, I'm finished. I'm out of here. Quit the ministry, quit marriage, quit life. I'm gone if that's not true. So you see, even when tenses are past, he made me his own. And that's why I'm straining forward to make him my own. It's because him making me his own guarantees I'm going to do it. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself here and starting to get on the slide 20. <laughs> but I just feel like i got to give you a flavor up front of where we're going and, and why it matters. So you could call it a seminar on sanctification. You could call it a seminar on the glory of God. Because if it's on sanctification, if it's on fearlessness and courage and hope, then it's on the glory of God because let your light so shine before men that they may see your good sanctified deeds and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's the way Father, the Father gets glory, right? We are transformed into the image of Jesus. We do things that are explainable only in terms of the glory of Jesus and people look and say, hmm, hmm. Their hope is somewhere else. They, their treasure must be something different than mine, by the way they love. So it could be a seminar on the glory of God, or it could be a class on the gospel. You could call it a class on the gospel. I just preached a sermon in this room yesterday at 12.30 to the Bethlehem College and Seminary folks, and... Uh, talked about Romans 8.32, which is maybe my favorite verse in all the Bible. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. That's the essence of the gospel in terms of its historic achievement. He did not spare his own son. If he did not spare his own son, will he not with him freely give us all things? Yes, he will. That's the logic. So the logic of heaven holds was the thesis of that sermon. If he didn't spare his own son, he will give us everything with him that we need now and the world and the universe thrown in in the age to come. And they relate like that. And so all we're talking about here is how this gives rise to this. I, wanna, I want this. I bank on this. Um, among the all things that he's going to give me for my good is the ability to talk for three hours. If I didn't believe that, I just couldn't come. There's enough butterflies, there's enough stuff going on inside me this afternoon that I would just say, what use, what use would I be tonight if, if, if one of the things you didn't buy for me on the cross was three hours worth of helpfulness? If you didn't buy that for me, what, what am I gonna do? So all I'm doing is unpacking the gospel. You know, when you talk gospel, you talk a plan, 
You talk an event in history, he died for us. You talk achievement, he removed the wrath of God and perfected righteousness and slayed, slew sin. And then you talk about application of that in our lives through faith. And then you talk about God. So you could say this is a seminar on God because the ultimate Grace of future grace is that we get God and nothing less will suffice or satisfy. Is that enough introduction? Look at my notes here. Okay. No. One more thing. I printed this out. Um... Raise your hand if you've ever sung the song, Standing on the Promises. You got to be under, huh, really? You guys are churchy. I thought it was too old for anybody to know. <laughs> we could sing it. Maybe we will at the end. But, but the reason I, I mentioned it is because in case you're thinking, Living by faith in future grace is a modern fandangle doctrine. Well, all I'm doing is unpacking this hymn, okay? That's all I'm doing. If your mama or daddy sang this song, they know what I'm going to say. I mean, if they thought about it. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God, I shall prevail standing on the promises of God. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Future grace, a fancy word for promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord. <laughs> overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. That's a really good song. You don't write them like that anymore. <laughs> but they write some good ones. Okay. Are we showing? That's slide number one out of 94. And, you know, I was praying on the bridge, coming over here, my revelatory bridge. Um, make it work out, Lord. I have, I have no notes. See, this, I mean, that's done. That was my introduction. So now I have, have no notes. I just have slides. So everything is what will come into my head when I show a slide. That, that's, that's all I got to go on. You can see why I'm desperate. I'm divide 94 into... Whatever six times 60 is, minutes, or 300, and, and, and it, see what it comes out. And I've already used 25 of them. So I have no idea how this is going to work. And, and it doesn't matter if we get through them all. What matters is that God show up and truth be spoken and, and you get help. So this is an iPad, by the way, if you want to. How are you doing this? I don't know. They just put it up here and I push the right buttons. <laughs> and I'm so skeptical, I want to keep looking to see is it really this? <laughs> I, I don't, I'm, that's another one of my problems. I'm, I'm really skeptical. I don't trust anybody or anything, which makes it hard in a relationship with God. So that's the outline of the course there. Um, first thing we're going to do is definitions. I've done some of them already. Then the question, so what? Why does it matter with uh, the passions behind it? Passion for the supremacy of God, passion for joy, and a passion for holiness. Is it biblical? When we talk, talk, talk about these things. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty Bible foundations of what you're saying. And fourth, how does it work? Now, those last two, how does it work for holiness? How does it work against sin? That's the, that's the practical, really, really practical part where we'll tackle, maybe if we have time, anxiety, covetousness, lust, bitterness, impatience. So 
I should say a word. Here's the present volume, Future Grace, big, thick, 400 play pages. Um, that's, that's going out of print here shortly, uh, and, and this will be the new one. This is, this is coming out in the fall, and I've, re, I've, I've edited Future Grace more than any book I've ever issued a new edition on because I've made exegetical decisions about some texts differently in the last 20 years, and so those changes will be reflected. The, the argument doesn't change any, and the illustrations don't change any, but a few foundational texts I understand differently now. So I think you've been given one of these. That's great. You can ask questions from that with your Twitter or Facebook and, and uh, wait for the new edition in the fall. Let's go to definitions. What do I mean by future? There you go, it's obvious. I'm, that part of time yet to be experienced. And the reason I just point the obvious out is that it evidently isn't obvious because when I use the term future grace, I think some people think heaven some people think some distant answer to prayer. And I mean whether I will finish this sentence. So when I think future, I mean now forward, for those seconds are now past. Which means the present the instant of experience is almost non-existent. And I don't want to get philosophical here because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know what time is. Time is a total mystery to me because when I try to figure out what's present, I can't find it. I just can't find it. It's always flopping into the past. The moment it's here, it's gone. And the future is always arriving. Bang, 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 bang. Second after second, it's coming at me. So whatever the... What I mean by present is the instant of experience. If you're experiencing something, that's the present for you. But how long it lasts, I, 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 don't, I don't know. A nanosecond, whatever that is. I mean, I, mean I, think, I think God can divide a nanosecond into an infinite number of pieces, which is why he's outside of time. It's just, I mean, it's just solely, it's just so... I don't know what I'm talking about, okay? So let's just, I mean, let's just, that's why I'm using the word experience. We know how we live. We know how we live. We know what past is. I was eating, bless your hearts, a piece of cinnamon raisin bread an hour ago. That's past. Huh. happy, good. Future, that's, I'm, in the future, I'm gonna change this slide. And in the future, I'm going to die. In the future, I'm going to face the judgment. Okay? So that's what I mean by the past is a reservoir that's getting bigger all the time, which is why gratitude should be growing all the time. Because Paul said rejoice, I mean, give, give thanks for everything. And everything is a lot, and it's getting bigger every second. So gratitude should be getting bigger every second because the past is getting bigger every second and there's more there to be grateful for. The future's not getting smaller. Is that glorious or what? So that's going on and starting now, then. And now again, it's starting. And now again, it's starting. So you see, I, I, you get the feel of what I'm talking about because this is where I live, folks. When I, when I couldn't talk in front of a group, and yet I tried in the eighth grade, and I had my one paragraph I had to read in physical science in the eighth grade, and it was on a, one of those ring uh, spiral binders, and I thought if it was stiff, I wouldn't shake so much. And as it was coming, I knew that the person getting up and walking to the front and reading his paragraph and coming back left me about five seconds. That was an infinite future for me. I walked out of the room. I went to the bathroom, and I cried my eyes out. I tell you, Five seconds of future really matters. You can walk away from your crucifixion. 
You can decide not to be a martyr in the last two seconds of your life. Two seconds of future really matters, really matters. So get what I'm saying about living by faith in future grace, meaning do you trust him for the next two seconds of the hardest conversation you may have ever have? This is just huge. This is the way we live the Christian life. It's the way we do the things we're called to do, and half the things we're called to do are hard to do. Things worth doing are usually hard to do. And therefore, you've you got to have help, and the help arrives in five seconds. You hope. You believe. Grace. God's omnipotent commitment to do only what is good for his unworthy people. Um. That's what makes it grace. That and unworthy people. Bringing them to conformity to Christ, glorification, and all satisfying joy in fellowship with himself. That's the ultimate goal of grace. That is, fulfilling all his promises to them because of Christ. This includes the help arriving in the next 10 seconds our inheritance in the resurrection arriving possibly centuries from now, and everlasting demonstrations of his kindness in Christ Jesus. So grace is all the good that comes to you in your lack of merit starting now. Anybody dead yet? Good. you got grace. Lots of it. You're breathing still. He gives to all men life and breath and everything. It arrives moment by moment. If he should withdraw his spirit, we would all fall over. We are living in a sea of grace. Definition of faith. Receiving Christ as the supremely valuable treasure that he is and being satisfied with all that God is and promises to be for us in Jesus. Okay, I'm trying to use biblical words here. We know the word receiving from John 1, 12. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but to as many as received him who believed in his name. Received him, comma, believed in his name. So receiving Jesus is a synonym for believing on Jesus, two different images. So there he is offering himself to me and all that God is for us in him, he offers himself. He says, I will be yours if you will have me. And faith receives him, embraces him for what he is. He is a savior, he is a Lord, he is a treasure. And so faith embraces him. If you say, I think I want him as savior but not as Lord. I think I want him as savior but not as treasure. You don't have him. You can't chop him up. He, he, he dies if you chop him up. You chop somebody in three pieces, they die. They're not who they are. So he is who he is, and he offers himself freely to all. And if we have him, we have the all that he is. And another way to say it is being satisfied with all that God is and promises to be for us. Now, that's huge. I'm going I'm to argue for that. That's, I'm just saying it right now. Later, I'll give you text to defend that. But that's huge because the secret of what I'm trying to, the problem I'm trying to solve in this course is why justifying faith sanctifies. Because so many have said, okay, we know what justification is and how to have it. Believe, receive, good. Here comes some, some right and wrong, right to be done, wrong to be avoided. Now, what do we do? How do we do it? What's the motive? Well, how do we go about this? And we've got to leave faith, that stuff, that's how we got saved. Now there's something else. Gratitude, obey out of gratitude, um, whatever. And my answer is no. That faith that saved you, if it's this kind, sanctifies you. 
You can see why. Which is why there's so many people who aren't saved who think they're saved. I think. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Because the faith that you put in me was just notional. It didn't, it didn't have anything of being satisfied with me in it. But we'll come back to that. Past grace or bygone grace. All the good that God has ever done for his undeserving people before this present instant in their lives. The death of Christ and his resurrection are the foundational acts of past grace that give rise to all others his people enjoy, past and future. Let me say why that complicated language is used. The guys around me over the years who've helped me refine these things and most anybody I read or ask me a question helps me, have pointed out to me that if I don't distinguish the gospel events, the death and the resurrection of Christ, from God helping my little girl get accepted to a college this week, can you believe that? At 16, going to do Paseo. Okay, just that's an illustration. I'm going to get everybody, folks who know Talitha, too excited here. Um, but now that's an answer to prayer. We bowed our heads. We thanked him for that because we asked for help. And he gave it. Now that's a grace. So there you have acceptance to a college provisionally uh, for this overlapping thing called post-secondary education option. And you have the cross. Whoa. <laughs> Really? I mean, you're going to put those in the same category? They ask me. I say, well, yes, but not at all, meaning they're the same worth. What I mean is that they're all God's good towards me, though I don't deserve either, and they're past. That's all. Now, if you say, how do they relate to each other? This one, the death of Christ for me, bought this one. That's what, that's the difference. So, when I say past grace, there are foundational graces like the death of Jesus for all the others. A couple of examples of the definitions. Hebrews 11.1, 1. now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Now that's the clearest statement about faith and its meaning in the Bible. And it fits it's my definition, okay? <laughs> I like this definition. This is faith in future grace. Faith is the assurance or the confidence. It's a very interesting word. Uh, it's the same word used in chapter 1 of Hebrews, verse 3, where Christ is the, the uh, exact nature of the Father the substance of the Father. So if you try that here, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Here's what I think that, that, I think what he's saying is this. Faith looks into the future and sees a possible future because of God's promises, and they, faith, faith sees it so clearly it has substance inside. It's, it's present to me now as a, as a future that's going to come true. And so the way you obey then, by faith, by that confidence about what God's going to do in the future, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So he went out by faith. So where does obedience come from in Hebrews 11? It comes from faith. What is faith? It's, I got a city. I got a city. Its foundations and designer and builder is God. I'm looking for it. That's faith and obedience flowing from it. Uh, 1 Peter 4.11 Whoever serves 
Do so as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So we gather downstairs before every service, pray for half an hour, and the most common text cited in our prayers to God is this one. Here we go, Lord. We want to serve now this people, and we want to serve in the strength that you supply. When? In the next hour, hour and a half. Why? Because the giver gets the glory. Now, that's not included here, is it? Because that's coming later. I'll finish the verse. Whoever serves, let him do so as the one who serves by the strength that God supplies, so that in everything God may get the glory through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the dominion forever. So, we walk up the stairs, each step, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you for this, the strength that God supplies, the strength that God supplies. I'm going to pause here. That's the end of my definitions, and uh, I'm seeing a little question flashing up there. I see the questions back here. Do you see them? There we go. So I'll just pause here. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to just pause periodically and see if people have questions. And uh, so Romans 8, 12. I saw this one this afternoon. That's not fair. It's the only one I saw. Um, so I was, able to, I was able to think about it, but I think I'm going to say the same thing I would have said if I didn't think about it. Um, Romans 8, 12 seems to indicate obedience motivated by the debtor's ethic. That's a little bit ahead of the game because I'm going to talk about the debtor's ethic in a few minutes. Um, I'm going to complain about the debtor's ethic. ethic. The debtor's ethic, I'm going to argue. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump ahead. Um, the debtor's ethic is he gave, he gave his life for me. What have I given for him? In the worst possible interpretation. That is, we live our lives by realizing God has done so much for us, we're so much in his debt that we spend the rest of our life trying to pay him back by doing good things for him. That's the debtor's ethic. And that's a real bad way to live. This text, the question says, um, seems to indicate that obedience is motivated by the debtor's ethic. What do you think, future grace? So I'll read it in context for you, and, then, and I think it'll be perfectly obvious what I'm going to say about it. It's, uh, I'll start at verse 11, Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that's present, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, that's past, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So because he raised Jesus from the dead, you can know for a certainty that he will raise you from the dead. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. So get all idea of thinking you owe anything to the flesh out of your mind. That's, that's the idea there. You don't owe anything to the flesh. You owe everything to the Christ raising, you raising God. Now, should we talk about paying debt to Christ or God for raising Jesus from the dead or promising to raise us from the dead. <laughs> and I can't help but think that Paul did not carry this through because he got uneasy with his language. That can be wrong, and it wouldn't change. But look, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And now you want him to say, but we are debtors to the Spirit. Well, I'd be fine. I can go with that. But he doesn't. He drops it. He doesn't go to the second half. He's just saying here, you don't owe anything to the flesh. You don't owe anything to the flesh, so don't ever think you owe anything to yourself or your accomplishment or what you are by nature. You owe everything to grace. And I'm very happy to say I'm a debtor to grace. 
How far ahead am I going to go here? Might as well go ahead and finish it. If you say, all right, I'm a debtor to grace, therefore I should pay God back for grace. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to obey him. In whose strength? Uh, his. So you're going to pay him back with his strength. This isn't going to work. I use a little image here. So obedience is me walking, okay? I have just been saved. He died for me. He secured me. He promises to raise me from the dead. I want to live for him. I am such a debtor to grace. I'm going to, I'm going to obey. Now, at that moment, you got to ask, okay, how, how does he get glory and how do you do that? 1 Corinthians 15.10 By the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain, but I worked harder than any of them. Nevertheless, it was not I, but the grace of God which was with me, which means every single step of obedience I take, I'm going deeper in debt. And that's the way it will be forever. Praise God. You will never be less in debt today than you are unless you're in hell. If you intend to go to heaven, the only pathway there is getting deeper and deeper and deeper in debt to grace. Every word you speak, every righteous thought you have, every action you do in reliance upon his power is reliance upon grace and you go deeper into debt, which means it is impossible to live the debtor's ethic to the glory of God. You can't pay him back. The Christian life is not an amortization schedule. It's just a, what's the other? It's a, it's a credit, a line of credit that is bottomless and you never make any payments, ever. You want to put up another question, or should we keep going? We'll keep going. Why does it matter? Passion number one. I'm going to zip through these really fast, because I I realize now, okay, not a problem. You've talked 51 minutes, and you've hardly started, so we're not going to have a problem filling up these hours. I always worry, worry. (laughs) Stop worrying, Piper. You're not going to have a problem filling up the hours, so get going here. And uh, we've done six slides. (laughs) There are passions behind this course. Number one, a passion for the supremacy of God. It's written on the wall up there. It's written here. We at Bethlehem exist to spread a passion for the supremacy of God in all things for the joy of all peoples through Jesus Christ. That's the passion of my life. That's the governing, what I get up in the morning thinking about. If I measure anything I do today, does it help make that happen? Why stress it? Because God stresses it. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not like silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. That's not hard to see. God is passionate for God here. If God's passionate for God, woe am I if I'm not. So answer, why do you, why you care about supremacy? Why well, you make that a mission statement? That is clear. So God does it. Here, here, this is familiar. How many of you that have bothered you? That Jesus, inspired by his Father, is telling us to pray, Father, be great, Father. Bring your kingdom, Father. Make the world full of your will. What? This is God telling me to pray for the glory of God. Isn't it? This is God saying, you want to know how to pray to me? Pray, 
Oh, may your name be sanctified, reverenced, honored, adored, cherished, treasured above all names. Yes, yes, pray to me that way. Your kingdom come. Yes, pray to me that way. I want my kingdom to come. I'm going to reign as king someday. Ask me. Ask me to make that happen. Okay, so this is clear. The first petition of all petitions that we should ever pray is, God, make your name great. So those two texts alone are enough to settle it for me, and there are hundreds. Just do a little word search on for your namesake or for your glory or just pick, pick one of those phrases and just start reading them all over the Bible. So that's number one. I'm going to skip those other arguments for it. Bang. Look at there. We're making progress here. Okay. <laughs> passion number two. A passion for joy. So passion for God's supremacy and now a passion for joy. These are things I'm after in thinking and writing and preaching for my life and for your life. I want my people to live for the supremacy of God and I want my people to be happy, supremely happy in God. So how do you serve? Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Or 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must give as he has decided in his own heart. So we're talking about tithing or giving to the church. Why and what should your motive be? Not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. So, if you write your check for the church begrudgingly, God is not happy about that. I mean, this is a pretty surprising word. God loves a cheerful giver. Like, how do you feel about those who give begrudgingly? Well, I don't love them. Oh. Whatever that means, we should be happy when we give. I mean, you just make it mean something that fits your theology. This is a real strong statement. When it comes to giving and say time, energy, money, self-giving, serving, washing each other's feet, laying down your life for each other, how do you do that? Joyfully? God doesn't want it any other way. It's legalism. I mean, one of the definitions of legalism would be reluctantly and under compulsion. I'm pointing as though you can see where my finger is pointing. And you can't. You can't. So, let me do that. Boom, boom. So, a passion for joy is biblical. We will see that living by faith in future grace means rejoicing in future grace. Let's take a sample text. This is Jesus, end of the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. Really. I mean, this is just one of the most. Rejoice and be glad when you are being persecuted and lied about. I tell you, that is so not me. Scary, isn't it? You're a disciple of Jesus, that you rejoice when you hear somebody's just written an email to so-and-so. It's not true. I didn't say that. You feel good about that? Rejoice. Be glad. Why? How can you do that? For great is your reward in heaven. There it is. that's, That's my life. My life is the battle to love heaven like that. I don't know what, what your battle is, but my battle every day is to go to this precious revelation of God and his future for me. And I mean short term, which is got a lot of pain in it, and longer term, which has no pain in it, 
and love his future, this one, the afflictions that work together for my joy, and that one without any afflictions, to love that future so fully that that email does not undo me, but provides, in fact, a ground of rejoicing in God's all-sufficiency. That's a miracle. If that happens, that's a miracle. It's called new birth. It's called living by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's called living by faith in future grace. So what I mean by future grace here is your reward is great in heaven. What I mean by faith is you're glad. Faith is being satisfied with all that God promises to be for you in the future. That's here. Your reward is great in heaven. So faith is this joyful embracing. You've promised a great reward. My faith says I substantially embrace and feel it. I embrace it. It is so satisfying to me. Punch, email. Really? Not bitterness. Not, I'm not bottoming out with despair. I'm not bottoming out with, with anger. I'm not bottoming out with plotting a revenge. I'm not bottoming out with endless self-justifications. I have a, enough grace to probe into something I might have said that would give them the impression maybe they didn't hear right. A little grace going on here, hopefully. This is the Christian life, being so satisfied. So my devotional life is up in the morning in the book trying to get my heart satisfied in the great reward so that it has that kind of effect. I'm not into, you know, pietism for pietism's sake. I'm into piety for radical love's sake. And this is radical love. We'll see later the relationship between that right there and the end of chapter 5 where he says, love your enemies, bless those who persecute you. We got those persecutors right there. Here, you're happy. There, you're blessing them. You think you can bless them if you're not happy in the moment when they persecute you? No, you can't. So, passion one, supremacy of God. Passion two, joy. Third passion, holiness. I said this was a seminar on sanctification, so we have a passion for holiness. And here's what I mean by holiness, practical holiness. I mean obedience to God's word in everyday life. So you can think in terms of obedience. That's a good biblical category to think in. Second, you can think in fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's a good biblical category. Obey is one. Fruit bearing is another. Or third, genuine love for other people. All those right there are holiness. Now, a, a verse, just to, if you might, you think, are you sure you want to kind of make love and holiness, a life of love and a life of holiness the same? Look at this. See if you think so. This is 1 Thessalonians 3. May the God, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that, now get the logic here, I'm praying that your love will get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger for people inside and outside the church, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. Does that make sense? To me, that says a life of mature, growing, abounding love for friends and enemies is holiness. A holy life is a life utterly devoted to the good of other people. And measuring all your actions by whether they hurt or help other people and crucifying your own passions wherever they are inclining you to exalt yourself and not bless others. So yeah, I, I do put love as the third definition of holiness there besides obedience and, and uh, what was the other one? Whatever. Why we have a passion for holiness. Now it gets complicated. It is the only pathway to eternal pleasure in God. No holiness, no heaven. So, what I'm saying is justification 
happens in an instant when we trust Christ and are united to Him by faith and His righteousness becomes ours and His perfection is counted as our perfection. And the Bible says those whom He justified, He also glorified. No dropouts. And the Bible also says you won't be glorified if there's no holiness lived out in your life. So let's see that and then tackle that problem because that's, that's one of the main reasons I wrote this. Trying to figure out how the pursuit of holiness doesn't mess up justification but grows out of justification and is absolutely necessary for final salvation without becoming legalistic. Key text to show that practical holiness is necessary for final salvation. Strive for the peace with everyone and strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If you don't have that, you won't have that. James 2, 17. So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Dead faith doesn't save. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. And the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So eternal life is coming through sowing to the Spirit. Verse 9 explains, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, what? Eternal life. If we don't give up, give up what? Doing good. Sanctification is not optional. So it makes the Christian life serious. I'm not an antinomian. One of the most, uh, one of the, I came here 32 years ago. My office was in, uh, in that building right there. This used to be a parking lot. I saw a woman get out, come in my office. We had planned for this, it was very serious. I knew she was having an affair. Her husband told me about it, and he wanted me to confront her, and uh, I did. She's still at the church, and so is he. Interesting. Um, so God is good. God is good. I sat her down, I said, you're seeing a man, and your husband has all the evidence. She said, I know. I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to to uh, call him and tell him it's over. I can't do that. Why? Uh, um, I, I, I care for him too much. And I don't do this with every counseling. I said, you know, if you don't call him, you'll probably go to hell. Chop off, better to chop off your hand and with one hand to go to heaven than with two hands to go to hell. Fornicators do not inherit the kingdom of God. Adulterers do not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I, I know and she knew that there's forgiveness in the world and of course, if she would repent, this is, and she did, and there's, there's a future. But at this point, I felt that's the right thing to say. I've done this several times and with, with amazing effect. She said to me, this, the reason I'm bringing this story up is this, she said to me, her, her jaw dropped, don't you believe in eternal security? She said, I'm a brand new pastor. I thought our pastors believed in eternal security. I said, yeah, I do, I do. I, I believe that the elect persevere to the end and you show whether you are elect by whether you make this call or not. (laughs) 
more or less. I said that. <laughs> Dramatic here. Um, she quoted to me Romans 8, 38, and 39. She had this worked out theologically. She said, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not, not things present, not things to come, nor principalities. Satan is tempting me to do this. And the Bible says, Satan can't separate me from the love of God. She had this all worked out for eternal security. And I said, the us in that verse is the elect, not everybody. Nothing can separate us. Everybody off the street isn't us. Everybody sleeping around isn't us. The us is the people who have been born again. The us is people who have faith and are justified. The us is people who are this. Let us not grow weary of doing good. Let us make the call tonight if you have to. Some of you are doing that, you know. You're doing it with your head, you're doing it with the internet, and some of you are doing it with her. So tonight at 10.30, make the call. And then come back rejoicing in the morning. Don't grow weary of doing good, for in due season you'll reap. Let me tell you another story. This is sad. 20 of you know who this is. One of our missionaries, 25 years ago, I won't even say the place because I don't want to make anything too hard for the survivors of this, slept with 18 prostitutes. And uh, we confronted him, flew there, and uh, came home. We met with him over and over again, and the last word, he's gone now, he, he, he just left the faith, left the church, left his wife, left his kids, horrible, and uh, no reconciliation to this day. Um, he said, I'm looking at the text here, he said, I just got tired of fighting the temptations. I just got tired. And he said, I'm finished. And he just gave himself to lust. So Paul is pleading with us, let's not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap eternal life if we do not give up. 1 John 2, 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. Truth is not in him. Words don't mean much by themselves. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you to be the first fruits, to be saved, how? Through sanctification. All right? Not by. Through. And there is no other pipe. Path. So we're justified. And those of me justified, he glorified. No dropouts. And if you're justified, you walk this path. And there's only one path, the path of sanctification. And don't, don't, don't lose heart. The path of sanctification and the path of perfection are not the same. There is no perfection in this life. That was the point of quoting Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already obtained or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because he has made me his own. I'm not calling you to live a life of necessary perfection. We would all be in hell if perfection, other than Christ's, we're necessary, but we are called to be saved through sanctification. First John 3.14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. So we've, we've passed out of death into life. We've been born again. We were dead, now we're alive. We were in the darkness, now we're in the light. Evidence, love for believers. Let's skip that one. Now, just a few texts to encourage us. Those texts that I just gave you are to say this third passion 
A passion for the supremacy of God, passion for joy, and our passion for holiness is a necessary passion. Without holiness, we won't see the Lord, which scares people. A lot of people haven't been taught that. Kind of like, Ugh. Some have been taught they can lose their salvation if they don't have it. I don't believe that because of Romans 8.30 and because of these texts. And others have been taught you don't have to have it. Doesn't matter what you do. Live like the devil from the day you sign your card until the day you die. And you go to heaven. Not true. And others have been taught work at it. Work really hard at it because it all depends on you. And that's not right either. So those are all bad ideas. These are the promises that make clear how to think about it. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. So I'm sure that what started will be brought to completion. That's precious. 1 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. God will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son. So he will sustain you guiltless in the day of Christ. He's faithful. He'll do it. Now may the Lord, may, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, make you whole and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think I left out verse 24. He's faithful. He'll do it. Jeremiah 32, 40. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they will not turn from me. I love that promise. So, a person like me, a reformed person, when he says eternal security, I believe in it, it's not automatic. Like you're saved and you have inoculation, okay? The inoculation means you pass at the judgment day. It has nothing to do with whether you live holy. That's just not what I mean by eternal security because it's not what the Bible means, what these texts mean. Eternal security means God has so saved you and so dwells in you and has made such a covenant with you that he himself will work in you what is required to get there. It's a very dynamic thing. You pray for it. I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I'll just ask you this, put, put the rubber on the road. Why do you think you won't wake up an unbeliever tomorrow morning? Why do you think that when you wake up, you won't say, I'm just sick of this. I'm just sick of church. I'm sick of those hypocrites. I'm sick of the Bible. It doesn't make any sense. I'm sick of trying the whole thing. And, and everything in you is saying, I'm done. And, and, and it comes true. Why, why do you think that won't happen? If you answer that, I won't let it happen. You're crazy. You're crazy. That's not why it won't happen. It won't happen because he puts the fear of him in your heart and they won't turn from him. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless for the presence of his glory. Romans 8, 30. Those whom he justified, he glorified. Now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Why do you wake up doing that which is pleasing in his sight? He did it. He did it again and again. The mercies of the Lord are new how often? And if they weren't, we'd become 
an unbeliever on his days off? Yes, we would. Our perseverance is a work of God. He works in us what is pleasing in his sight. And so my security, my eternal security, is not only because the cross is all sufficient to cover all my sins, but because the power of God now and ever arriving at every moment from the future will keep me in the face. Now, a problem. I'm going to finish this unit on holiness and then we'll take some questions. If we are justified once for all by grace through faith, apart from works at the point of true conversion, which we indeed are, then how can our final salvation be conditional upon a transformed life of holiness? Okay, does everybody see the question? I totally believe that when I put my faith in Jesus, six years old, was united to Jesus by that simple act of childlike faith, his righteousness was counted as mine, and his death covered all my sins, bought permanently, securely, infallibly, invincibly, the forgiveness of all my sins forever. That's what I believe happens in Christ and my union with him. And now I'm saying, and final salvation, heaven, joy, is conditional upon this life and its holiness. Are those contradictory? They're not. How do they fit together? I just put a couple of verses here for affirming justification. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Well, I skipped one. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So we are justified by faith. Those who be justified, he glorified, and yet this holiness is required. What is the answer to that problem? Here's the solution of the Westminster Confession. Let's see if it's adequate. Those whom God effectually calleth, he also freely justifieth, not by infusing righteousness into them, that's a rejection of the Roman Catholic understanding of justification, and I think that's right, not by infusing righteousness into them, that's what he does with sanctification, that's not what he does in justification, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone. I totally agree with that. I love that. That's beautiful. Paragraph two. Faith, thus receiving and resting on Christ. Yes, that's what faith does. Receives, rests on Christ and his righteousness is the alone, or we would say the sole, or the only instrument of justification. Yes, indeed. Yet, okay, here it comes. It is not alone in the person justified, but is ever accompanied with all other saving graces. So all those acts of holiness, fruits of the Spirit, and is not dead faith, but worketh by love. That's a quote from Galatians 5, 6. So the answer of the Westminster Confession is the reason you can have final salvation contingent upon my experiencing acts of holiness here is because the faith that justifies is never alone. 
It is faith alone that justifies, and the faith that justifies is never alone. But is ever accompanied, is ever accompanied by all other saving graces. I think that's true. And the reason I wrote this book is because it, it's not enough. Why? Why is the faith that justifies always accompanied by other graces? Why? It is remarkable how little reflection in the Reformed tradition has gone into that question, I think. I'm not an expert in church history, but as I've poked around, you know what the usual answer is? We receive the Holy Spirit when we trust Jesus and are justified, and the Holy Spirit bears his fruit. Now, that's true. That's gloriously true. So my question is, is there a connection between faith and the activity of the Holy Spirit in an ongoing way by which he enables me to do these holiness acts by which I will be seen to be new, born again? That's going to be the evidence at the last day. And my answer is yes, and I wrote this book to explain it. Yes, the faith that justifies also sanctifies because it is faith in the promises of God and the Holy Spirit has set things up in such a way that he flows along the channel of faith in future grace. And there's reasons for that. Biblical reasons are given for that, which we'll get to shortly. Let me see if we're at a stopping point. Um, so the question is, why does practical holiness or love inevitably accompany justifying faith? Uh, just gave my answer, let's read it. Faith itself is the agent of the works. They do not merely accompany faith. They come through or by faith. Faith is the agent that produces the works and it does so necessarily. Thus the works are evidence of true faith and are not the means of our salvation the way faith is. They are the evidence that faith is real and thus are necessary for final salvation, but they are not the ground of our salvation the way the death of Christ and the righteousness of Christ are, nor are our works the means of our salvation the way faith is. That's complicated and we'll talk more about it. Let me see if I'm stopping here. Oh, I've got this analogy. I'm going to skip it. So, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it in my own words instead of reading it. Um, two prostitutes have babies, remember? And one of the prostitutes' baby dies. And in the middle, middle of the night, this is in the reign of Solomon, she gets up and she takes the live baby from one prostitute. She puts her dead baby in the arms of the prostitute and goes back to bed. And the woman wakes up and she sees her dead baby and she's distraught. And then she looks at the dead baby and says, that's not my baby. That's my baby. And they, they, their case makes it all the way to King Solomon. And so they, they walk in with this living baby and Solomon, now the analogy here is Solomon is like God and the real mom is like a saint who's been justified. Solomon looks at them and says, okay, what do I need to do here? I need to discern publicly for all to see so the justice is done who the real mom is. He's not going to create a mom. Nothing she does is going to make her a mom. She's a mom. That's a done deal. Just like you're born again. You're not going to be born again at the judgment. You just need some evidence. So he says, uh, let's cut the baby in half. <laughs> and like an idiot, 
the, the false mom says, yeah, that's a good idea. And the, the real mom says, no, 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 let her have it. Don't cut the baby, don't, cut, don't hurt the baby. And Solomon says, give, give the baby to this woman here. Why? Did her works earn her the baby? Did her works create motherhood? No. The work of give her the baby simply showed I'm a mom. I've been born again. I mean, in the analogy, I've been born again. So when I think the works are required at the last day, I say God has set things up so that public justice requires a, a public reckoning so that there will be evidence of your new birth at the last day, and that evidence is your holiness or your obedience or your love. How then does faith do this great work? Faith severs the root of sin. Sin has power by promising a better tomorrow or at least a better this evening and by promising superior satisfactions. Now pause and see if you agree with that. How does sin work in your life? Just pick a sin. Could be complaining, could be lying, could be anger, whatever. Um, deceit, pornography, whatever your besetting sin is. How does it work? Nobody sins out of duty, right? Nobody gets up in the morning and says, I don't want to sin today, but I think I should, and so I will. Nobody has ever, ever sinned like that. Sin has power because it promises us things. Maybe very subtle, maybe very non-articulate. It, you'll, you should be angry here, and you'll feel better if you're angry here. I ought to be angry here, and it's right to be angry, and I feel justified in being angry, and... I mean, you're not saying to yourself, sin is making a promise, but it is. It's promising you something. Lust clearly, it, the only reason anybody clicks through to pornography is because it's, it's promising them something. A rush. It's a lie. I mean, they will get a rush, but that their future will be better for that, that's a lie. Sin is always lying to us. So sin has power in our lives because it promises. It makes promises. So, how do you defeat promises? Answer, with superior promises. You can spend your whole life trying to say no to the promises of sin, and if all you've ever developed in your strategies of sanctification is no, 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 you're a goner. You're an absolute goner. You will be known, I mean, many churches are built around this. I, I've seen churches like this, and they're just so sad. The whole congregation thinks in terms of holiness is no, no, can't, can't, don't, don't. It's just no overflowing alternative that's putting to death those things without even. So, but true faith, I'm here, but true faith is of such a nature that it severs the root of sin by embracing a better future and providing a deeper satisfaction. I've got a whole section on lust, which we'll get to tomorrow, Lord willing, but I can't help but just stop right here on this pornography thing and say, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now, what that says, among other things, is if you click through, you will lose friendship with him and sight of him. He will become cloudy and he will be more distant. Is that what you want? And if you click through, the answer is yes. I want this rush more than I want to see God. And if you'll, if you'll stay there, think there, pray there, linger there, plead there, not 
How can I say no? How can I say no? How can I say no? But how can I love his face? How can I love his fellowship? How can I love his intimacy? How can I love his friendship so deeply, so satisfyingly? This loses its power. That's the way. That's the battle of life. The future grace of God is better than the future, is the better future, and faith is in future grace is the deeper satisfaction. When you live by faith in future grace, the power of sin is broken by the power of a superior satisfaction in all that God promises to be for us in Christ. So that's the summary of the class, the seminar right there. So summary now, passion for God's supremacy because he's so jealous for his name, passion for joy because he wants us to fight the fight of faith gladly and serve him with joyfulness and, and a passion for holiness because there's no heaven without holiness and because we, we lay hold on him because he laid hold on us, which raises these three questions. What kind of life will magnify the supremacy of God most and what kind of life will forever satisfy the deep longings of the soul and what kind of life will produce practical holiness that's necessary for salvation but do it in such a way that our justification is still by grace alone, through faith alone, based on Christ's death and imputed righteousness alone and the answer to all three questions is living by faith in future grace, hence the seminar. Now I think this is a place for questions. Let's see what's next here, yep. So here we go from Facebook, got that? I would like to know how, in the heat of temptation, we can, for lack of a better term, convince ourselves that the promises of God are indeed superior. How can we practically do this when sin looks so appealing it can be hard at times? And that is absolutely true. So, let me say a... <laughs> an advertisement first. I sh you should never do this probably, but you spend much time on something. This, this question is um, the most often asked question in the last 30 years of my ministry. You get done with the class on desiring God or class on future grace or class on pledges of God, all of them have the same point. Um, namely that God is most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him and when we're most satisfied in him, we sever the root of sin and get victory over temptation. And this is asking how? So hard. These, this rush is really immediate. I can feel it already. I don't feel how happy I'll be with, with the sight of God. And, and after 30, after 25 years of that, I, I wrote a book to answer the question. It's called, When I Don't Desire God, How to Fight for Joy. So this how question, I mean, if you want to know 200 pages worth of my answer, there's the book, okay? That, that's not a helpful answer right now, I, I know. <laughs> but I, I want you to know, I, 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 this is pretty much all I think about. Not only because the question comes so much, but because I, I get up every morning and my bucket leaks meaning my satisfaction in God, which is the only means by which I can, in a gospel way, defeat sin, it, it's drained out overnight. I don't know why. It doesn't happen to everybody that way. I'm just not a morning person, and I wake up and I have to, I have to fill it again. So my first answer is, in the heat of the moment is not the best place to fill your tank. Not that you shouldn't try by calling to mind appropriate promises, but a lifetime of morning, noon, and night in communion with God, cultivating a heart affection for Him is the key. It's not being distant from God and indifferent to God for a week, having this... this uh, advertisement come up on your sidebar with this scantily clad woman and being prepared at that moment to have the wherewithal to prefer Jesus to anything you might do there. That's not the way it works. Okay, so that's the first thing I would say. I, I hope one of the effects of this 
seminar is to set you on a course of morning, noon, night. Pick, pick time. Set them aside. Choose a little chair somewhere in your house, a kneeling bench somewhere. We're going to retreat there, maybe for just five minutes in the middle of the day, maybe an hour in the morning, maybe ten minutes at night. And the whole point of going there is to strip away everything else, get on your face before God and say, incline my heart to your testimonies, O God. Satisfy me in the morning with your steadfast love. So we're pleading with God to satisfy us and open our eyes to the, to the word. Um, maybe one other thing about the heat of the moment. I'm sure that when Jesus said, um, um, that you, you're not supposed to commit adultery, you've already committed adultery in your heart, and then he went on and, and said, if your hand, listen, look, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better for you to enter life with, uh, maimed than with two eyes to go to hell. I, I'm sure that's in the Bible because hell is more um, feelable in the moment of temptation than heaven. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. If you're mature, it wouldn't be. But isn't Jesus kind that he would say to us, okay, in the moment when you're about to suicidally click through to lust and have an affair in your heart, I'm telling you, you could go to hell for this. That's helpful. Unless you don't believe it. If you don't believe it, it's not helpful. If you, if you ask, how's that future grace? Ah, uh, ah, uh, that's a good question. How's that living by faith in future grace? I'm going to cut off my hand rather than click this button. Cut it off. The answer is, that threat is, I want to help you realize how valuable a future in heaven is and a future with me is by threatening how much you could lose if you don't walk with me. Warnings in the Bible are the flip side of future grace. They are cautions. This is what can happen if you throw away future grace. This is what can happen if you don't embrace all that I promise to be for you in the future. You don't want to go there. And I think, realistically, children who are not yet capable of exulting in the glories of heaven know totally what hell is. Is that not true? I would guess 80% of you who got saved as a child got saved because you're scared of hell. It's, it's not sufficient. Can't stay there. But my, how many get started there, and God meant it that way. He, he meant us to fly away from hell to Christ, and then he meant for us to stay with Christ and love Christ and be satisfied in Christ because of who Christ is, not just because that's bad. So the warnings are also um, important. Here, maybe one last thing. Stock up. If you know your besetting sins, all right? I, I said fear is one of mine. Fear of man, just nervous about various phone calls and conversations and talks, just anxiety about whether I can say something helpful. So I have to stock up some promises suited for that. Now, if, if porn is your besetting sin, then in the cooler moments, stock up three or four juicy promises that talk about how satisfying he is. Memorize the first three verses of Psalm 63. Memorize Psalm 42. Is a deer pants for the spring, so my soul pants for you, O God. Say that to yourself. You may not be feeling it, but if you, if you say it and ask, open my eyes, you might start feeling it. So have a little store in the back of your brain over here, anti-porn store, and pull out the sword and stick it, stick it with that promise. Okay, question from Twitter. If perseverance is God's dynamic, continuous work to get us there, can you elaborate on their destination trajectory? What I mean by there is final glorification. Those who are justified are 
glorified. The final destination is not death and being with Christ. That's a glorious step on the way. Far better to be with Christ, Paul said, than to be here. But he also said in 2 Corinthians 5, I don't want to be naked, meaning I don't want my body to be stripped off and my soul to go out there without. I want, I want to be overclothed with life. I want my new body. So the ultimate is new body, new earth, new heaven, no sin, ever increasing joy in the presence of God with Jesus as the supreme treasure around which all other goods are appropriately well ordered so there's no idolatry anymore and no temptation to love pizza more than Jesus. And and I'm sure there'll be pizza there, but it will not be a temptation at all. And something better than sex will be there. No marriage or giving in marriage in the age to come, but better, like a thousand times more exquisite than the best sexual climax. Yes, it will be. So don't feel like, oh, shoot, no sex? Boring, wrong. You, you not, you're little. I mean, you're a child if that's the way you think. You just haven't gotten very far in knowing what spiritual delights are for and how everything is gonna be bumped up. If you love trees, trees are gonna be a thousand times better. If you love dogs, dogs are gonna be a thousand times better. I I would almost say cats, but I have my doubts. (laughs) No, I don't have any doubts. A sanctified cat, I can just see it. So humble, so humble, just like a dog. Don't get me going on cats, but I've just alienated half of you, I know. I don't like cats, but I I can imagine, I can imagine a holy cat. I know Jesus is the Lion of Judah. Big cats are different. I, I gotta stop that. What were we on? Oh, this question, um, what is the future? One of the reasons I'm talking like this, you know why? As a kid, I was scared of heaven. It was just gonna be boring. I I just, I mean, I wouldn't tell anybody. I couldn't tell anybody. I was 11 years old. I was lying down on the top of my house, the roof. We had little spiral stairways to go up the roof. And I'd lie on the roof and I'd look into the starry night sky and I'd be scared. And not of hell, but of heaven. I don't like the songs we sing at church. (laughs) The preacher is not that engaging. I I had no, I wasn't mature enough to have any sense that this is gonna be glorious. And so I'm, when I'm working with kids and I'm assuming you're all kids, uh, you're not all, but some of you are still there. Like you need help to realize a new heaven, a new earth, a new body in the likeness of Jesus, glorious body, no sin anymore to contaminate any of my desires, everything centered on the most glorious, beautiful, wonderful, wise, strong person that ever was is going to be better than anything you've ever tasted 10,000 times over. So that's the answer to that question as best I can do it. One more maybe. How would one engage a spouse that has less faith than you? Wow, that's a good question too. Well, 1 Peter 3 is for the wives of unbelieving husbands, um, telling them not to try to manipulate them with their clothing or makeup or sexiness, but rather to become a certain kind of person on the inside. It would involve being afraid of nothing. I love this text. I, if I would develop you know, a beautiful image of magnificent womanhood besides Proverbs 31, I'd, I'd go here. I have in a couple of messages six things that submission is not. <laughs> I believe in wives submitting to their husbands, but this text is roaring with glorious implications. And one of them is Sarah and the women of old were fearless. 
So she's fearless around this man. She's fearless. She laughs at the future, according to Proverbs 31. And that fearlessness, uh, being so confident in God, makes her meek without being weak and enables her to discern and love this unbelieving man in a way that might, God blessing her, win him over without a word. Now, I don't think that without a word there means she can't talk about her faith because he knows she's a Christian. It means she's not going to nag him. She's not going to manipulate him and push him. She's going to wait for the appointed times and uh, pour herself out for him if she can. I know there are situations, and I want to treat this as though there are no impossible situations of deadly abuse from which she should be rescued by the elders of the church from him. But if we don't go that far and just talk about a courteous unbeliever, then there's good help in that text. The man, um, I think, should take a lot of his cues from that text. Um, We're not called to submit in the same way. We're called to be servants. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And that's not spoken just to believers. Marriage is a creation ordinance, not an ordinance of redemption. Marriage has its meaning because we're human, not because we're Christian. Christians understand the meaning of marriage for those outside, and the meaning is it's a parable of Christ and the church. And how does Christ mainly relate to his church? He dies for her. He spends himself to build her up, and he would need great wisdom if she doesn't want to be built up in the faith. She doesn't want anything to do with this Christianity. And he will need to then plead with the Lord to know, how can I love her well? And I would just encourage him to immerse himself in the Word and get around him, brothers, to pray for him, Um, have the wives of those brothers counsel him, as to their discernment of the situation and what she might need from him. You should do a seminar on marriage, I suppose. Okay, I'm gonna, that's three questions. Let me look here and see. Um, is this answer biblical? So basically, I think we've seen enough that you get the idea what I think the answer is to a life of holiness, Uh, a life of living out the gospel, a life of fulfilling the requirements to get to heaven without becoming a legalist, and a life of triumph over sin, and a life of satisfaction in God. Now, let's go to the Bible and see more of it. Faith is the great worker. That's what I'm arguing when I said it was was the agent. And if, if that jarred you a minute ago when I said faith is the agent of holiness because you were thinking, I thought the Holy Spirit was the agent, which that's a good thought to have, I will get to that, okay? They both are agents. They're not agents in the same way. So here we go. Here's why I'm using the term faith as a worker or faith as an agent of our holiness. We give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So you need to ponder what is work of faith? And I think work of faith means a work that flows out of, is prompted by, is somehow generated by Saving, justifying faith. 2 Thessalonians 1.11, 
To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve and for good and every work of faith by his power. So now we see that that fulfilling resolves and getting the work done that we ought to get done in holiness is done by his power through faith. So faith is, is something I'm experiencing and power is something that, how should we talk about it? Awakening the faith, flowing through faith, responding to faith, how does it, how does it come? And that's where we're going to, to try to get specific about how does the power of God relate to my trusting a promise, all right? So I have to speak at this conference and I'm nervous and I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna obey, I'm gonna do this work of coming over here to the church How? I'm gonna trust a promise, and the promise would be, I will help you, I will strengthen you, I will hold you up till 10 o'clock, that's what I'm gonna do for you. I've done it a thousand times, I'm gonna do it tonight. Will you believe me? That's the way I do it, I believe believe you. All right, now as I'm believing him, what does power have to do with that? Is that just me? My answer is, we'll see it, that I was able to call to mind a promise, that I feel any inclination to bank on the promise, that I'm able to feel some sense of hope and confidence and boldness rising in my heart through the promise is all of God. That's the power. That's power. If you sit in your room when you have a phone call to make that's hard to make, or a test to take at school, or a relationship that needs some cultivating, or whatever. If you just sit in your room and say, okay, I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to do this by the power of God. <laughs> All right, I'll wait. It won't come. And here's the reason. It's a work of faith. Faith. Faith is something you act. God doesn't act it. He enables it. He flows through it. It's his fruit. But you act it. We're doing a conference in the fall on sanctification called Act the Miracle. Uh Uh-oh. My technology's falling apart. That's, that's, That's not a problem. Acts 26, 18. I send you, Paul, this is Jesus talking to Paul, I send you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's the clearest statement that sanctification is by faith in all the Bible. So the holiness that they're going to move into and grow in will be by faith in me. Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. Now, the the issue is justification here. And what justifies, and he says circumcision doesn't justify. Uncircumcision doesn't justify. Those do not count for anything. Well, what counts for justification? Answer, faith counts for justification. And then just like James, if you ever feel a tension between James and justification by works and Paul and justification by faith, this is Paul's way of saying what James says, faith without works is dead. If you say, what kind of faith Paul justifies? His answer is the kind of faith that works through love. It isn't the working through love that justifies. The working through love shows you the faith is alive. It's the kind of faith that justifies. It's not a dead faith. It's alive. And it works, and the way it works is through love. And we'll see why. 
1 Timothy 1, 5, the aim of our charge is love. So that's holiness, obedience, love that issues from a pure heart, good conscience, and sincere faith. So where is love coming from? Faith. Faith. In future grace, I'm going to argue. If you're having a hard time tonight doing an act of love or growing in the affections of love, the answer, Paul says, is you need to work on this. Sincere, authentic, resting in Christ, trusting in Christ, treasuring Christ, enjoying Christ, banking on the promises of Christ. There's where the battle is fought. Hebrews 11, 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed. That's pretty clear. When he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. Grace, the grace in which we trust, is not only God's disposition to save the unworthy. That's what we usually think about grace. Grace is uh, God, um, un unmerited favor is the way it's usually defined, isn't it? Unmerited favor. And that's absolutely right. But I'm, I'm making sure we see the future part of it. Grace in which we trust is not only God's disposition to save the unworthy, but grace is the power of God exerted to bless us in the future with all that we need. So when I talk about future grace and faith in future grace, I mean faith in the power of God exerted to bless us. I think our obedience, our love, is enabled when we can count on God blessing me five minutes from now or 100 years from now, whenever it's needed. So here's, here's some illustrations of grace's power. By the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain, but on the contrary, I worked hard harder than any of them. So clearly, grace is producing that work, right? I worked, I worked. That's risky, right? I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I. Well, come on, Paul. Was it you or wasn't it you? I worked. Yes, he did. But it was not I. No, he didn't. It was the grace of God that was with me. One plants, another waters. God gives the gross, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. Not I. Well, we, we, we need to plant. We need to water. Yes, you do. You plant, you water, you obey. But when you're done, not I but the grace of God that was with me. I act the miracle. And because it's a miracle, it wasn't, let's add a word, it wasn't decisively me. It was me. I mean, right now, am I preaching? I'm preaching, or whatever you call this, teaching, preaching. I'm doing this, hands, voice. Jump. I'm doing this. Now, when I get home tonight, if God has been merciful, I will say, I worked really hard at that. But if anything good comes, if anything lasting happens, it won't have been me. If you don't believe that, you're going to be a pretty arrogant Christian, I think. So, grace is a power, and it's a, an, a power that arrives as you need it. Isn't that implied here? On the contrary, I worked, so he's working, and he has to work tomorrow, and as he's working, grace is enabling him to work. This is interesting. Here's the reason 
you wonder why you put these two verses here. This is the f- at the beginning of a letter, and this is the end of the letter. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before. I didn't notice this until I wrote this book. It's like 1994 or something. I did not notice this. At the beginning of every single one of Paul's 13 letters, he says something like grace to you. He always uses the word to. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. And at the end of every single letter, he says grace be with you. That's amazing. (laughs) I get amazed by things like that. (laughs) I mean, I would expect it, you know, to be sort of consistent. So I ask Paul, why do you say grace to you at the beginning of the letters and grace be with you at the end of the letters? Grace is great. We're talking grace here now. I'm trying to figure out what grace is and how it comes as a power. So these people are already saved and he's asking grace to come. Although they have grace, yes, but they get more grace. We live by more grace every day. Tomorrow's grace is what I need tomorrow, not today. I need today's grace today. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, and sufficient unto the day is the mercy thereof. They're new every morning, and so are the troubles. And that's the way it works. So why do you, why do you say grace to you and grace be with you? I don't know, but here's my idea, okay? You test it, maybe you have a better idea. My idea is... Because I've never read an essay on that. I've never read an article on this. I've never seen anybody write about this. So if you know an article about this by some, you know, reputable Bible thinker, tell me. My guess is that a letter in a uh, pre-literate, you know, nobody has Bibles. This letter's going to be read. There's one precious parchment and, and and... Epaphroditus took it, or Timothy, or Titus took it, and, and we've got a letter from the apostle. They're all gathered together on the Lord's day or someday, and they're going to read it. So they open it up, and it starts out, grace to you, knowing they're all gathered. They're all gathered together, and as they're gathered together, I'm speaking to you now for the next half hour, Paul. Colossians is being read to you. I want grace to come to you as I'm reading, as I'm speaking to you. So the, my words are being read to you. That's grace coming to you right now. And now he's coming to the end. Half hour's over. Letter's being read. They're about to close the book. Pray, go home, back into the hard places. Slaves, masters, work. Everything's hard out there. Just a few Christians in the Roman Empire. And they're going to go out there. What are they, they going to go with? He says, grace be with you. That's what I think's going on. In other words, what, what, it, what it sheds light on to me is how Paul feels and thinks about grace as a power. He's saying, as my word is being read and preached, grace is coming to you, power's coming to you. God has ordained to come through his word in power. Don't go out in the woods without your Bible and pray for power. You're gonna get it, it won't be his. And you'll do many mighty works in his name and go to hell. That's what Jesus said. Matthew 7, 24. Instead, take your Bible. Because when the word is coming, power is coming. Grace is coming. God has linked together his spirit and his power and his grace with his word. And then as they go out from the reading of the word and the preaching of the word, he says, grace go with you, meaning all that's happened here, all that you've learned here, everything you've gotten here, may it stay fruitful now in your lives as God keeps bringing it to mind. That was a great discovery for me. I loved it. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. That's future so that having all sufficiency in all things at all, all times, you may abound in every good work. That's one of the greatest promises in the Bible. God is able to make all grace abound to you tomorrow. Or what are you facing? Some of you came here looking for, desperately looking. Some of you are desperate and hoping that something will happen, something will click, something will come. 
that will enable you to blank. I'm tempted to list off the kinds of things that God might be doing. Quit your job and go to the mission field. Be reconciled to a spouse you haven't had sex with living in the same house for two years. Own up to a lie you told two years ago at work. It was whatever. You just, you're, you're, you're tormented inside about something and you're hoping this will be it and, and this is this. God is able tomorrow, two weeks from now, a month, to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency for, not, not sufficiency to jump off a barn, but to, to do what you have to do. He, no test has befallen you but what is common to man, but with the test he will make a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He, he won't test you beyond what he gives grace to enable you to do. In all things, at all times, these are just sweeping statements in every good work. That statement has troubled me for years. What does every good work mean? You will have grace for every good work. Like helping a man right now who just had a flat tire in Beijing? No. Okay, not that, not that good work. That's not for you. So, how, it's not every? I mean, every? No, no, not every, like that. Well, like what? It's not an easy question. It's a good question, though. Everyone you're supposed to do, everyone he calls you to do. Good Samaritan. Why is the Good Samaritan in the Bible? The story of the Good Samaritan. To tell you that you're not responsible for everybody, just the guy you pass. I mean, there were people 10 miles away who didn't know this guy was lying on the side road. They're not responsible. The priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, they're responsible. You walk by this guy, you fail. If you didn't show up on this road and don't know he's there, not a fail. Every good work doesn't mean every possible good work. It means the good works you're called to do. And Ephesians 2.10 says they're prepared for you before the foundation of the world. By grace, through faith, for every good work which God has prepared for those who are his. So there's going to be grace for that good work. And faith in future grace means we trust him to give this grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power, so there's grace and power aligned, is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly boast of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Does that not mean something has happened to me? I'm weak physically, I'm weak emotionally, I'm exhausted. Um, I'm weak emotionally because I haven't slept for two days and therefore my, my temper is close and I'm really easily depressed and I'm really vulnerable and weak right now. And Jesus comes and says, I know that. You do need sleep. You should get some sleep. But since you can't right now, my grace is sufficient for you. And when he says that, faith in that ever-arriving grace over the next eight hours embraces the promise and gladly boasts in the weakness. That's faith in future grace. Embracing the promise, my grace is sufficient for you. I uh, got an email one hour before I came over from one of our pastors who will do the funeral for a 21-month-old child. Probably some of you are connected with that situation. I forget the day he said, next day or next few days. 
He hasn't done much of these funerals, and uh, I've been here 32 years. I've done a lot of funerals, a lot of children, suicides, unbelievers. And so he just said, any counsel? <laughs> Anything you want to say that would give me a pointer? And among this, I didn't have much time, but I know if I don't do this now, I won't, I won't get it done. So fitting it into my crunched preparation here, which maybe just so I could tell you, um, I didn't think about it at the time. I said, uh, I wouldn't linger long over the destiny of the child. You can talk about that later. And trust him to the Lord. Don't, don't get too theological about heaven, hell, election. Just, just say God is good and God will, God will take care. Focus on the horrific nature of this loss. Focus on this pain. Focus on the magnitude of what the present people are dealing with and give them a promise. And this is what I quoted. And the reason I did is because in this text, the list of weaknesses are very unusual. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And I said, I think calamity fits here. I, th I think hardship fits here. I don't know if he'll use this text, but I closed it by saying, his grace will be sufficient in that situation if they will receive it, and it will be for you too at the funeral. So, this is precious. This has endless applications. This is, this is one, of those, one of those, you know, not, not in the porn store necessarily back here, but in the tiredness, exhaustion, I'm at my wit's end, I can't do this week, I can't do this week. It, this week is not possible for a human being on the planet with time the way it is. Uh, put it in that store and then bring it out. Okay, my grace will be sufficient here. And I, I came into this week feeling that way. A funeral, I had to do a funeral on Monday and some, there goes my day off. That's gone, and uh, I wasn't going to exist anyway. And then Tuesday had a long 90-minute interview I had to get ready for and do. And then what was Wednesday? Uh, I forget, but something consumed Wednesday. Thursday I had to preach in chapel. Friday I got to prepare my sermon for Sunday and get ready for this. My sermon's not ready for Sunday yet. This was one of those weeks where I walked, I looked at it at the front end and I said, can't be done. I'm so glad my wife is in China, you know, because uh, she is, and, and because this is one of the weeks where I said, okay, at least I don't have a wife to, to fret about my pace, because this is flat out morning to night, seven days. And then I'll, I'll rest on Sunday and Monday next week, I hope. Pastor, it is, you don't make a call. Um, but you know what? I'm 66, and I've seen these weeks so many times. I said, after I said to David Mathis, this is an impossible week, I said, it'll happen. <laughs> it'll happen. God will do it. I don't know how. And it will. I was all fired up for my sermon this afternoon. I cut off, you know, preparation at about five. It'll take me probably mm, another 90 minutes when I get home tonight to finish that sermon. But it's there. I know what I'm going to say, and I'm excited to say it. So come back on Sunday. <laughs> All that to say, his grace is sufficient, and I love him for it. Conclusion about grace's power. Therefore, though grace was given to us before the ages began, and was the disposition of God that moved him to send his son to die for us, it is also a divine power promised for our entire future and given for our present experience. 
pause for a question. Got any more, Tony? How does future grace relate to Paul's confidence in 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. Is this hope that God will keep him physically safe, protect him spiritually? Um, let's go there, 2 Timothy 4.18. Second Timothy four eighteen. This is not an unfamiliar text to me. You know why? My first anniversary here at Bethlehem, okay, is we're talking July nineteen eighty one. I remember the sermon I preached on my first anniversary is this text. And I wrestled with that exact question. It's really fresh to my mind. 31 years later, just because I, 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 my, my text was, verse 17, the Lord stood by me. I'm so green. I'd been here a year. I'd never been a pastor before. I skipped all the practical courses in seminary. I'd preached maybe five times before I came here. I'd never buried anybody. I'd never married anybody. No, that's not true. I married one of my students two of my students, Tom Steller and Steve Calvin, and I had never done a baby dedication. I had never baptized anybody. I was so green, and now I survived a year, and I was so thankful. The Lord stood by me. He did. The Lord stood by me. And now, 32 years later, my, do I love this text. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. What does that mean? Does that mean I didn't get thrown to the Colosseum yet? Or does it mean Satan did not get the upper hand and devour me who prowls around like a roaring lion? I think it's the latter. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Why? The the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. Now, does that mean the deed of the Caesar who's going to chop off my head, which he did? So he didn't get rescued from that evil deed. Or is the rescue from his evil deeds? which would be what Satan would really delight in if he could bite down on him, make him give up the faith and make him lust and make him get angry at his people who abandon him in Rome. And why do I think it's that? Because, and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. You don't get brought safely into the heavenly kingdom by not being eaten by lions. Being eaten by lions brings you to the heavenly kingdom. (laughs) The question is, will you get there safely? Meaning not abandoning the faith, not committing evil works. That's my answer to that text. It's my take on it. Got another one, Tony? How do I, as a father, help to cultivate an environment of faith and future grace in my home when I feel like my tank is empty? Um, what shall I say? Devote the lion's share of your energies to getting your tank full. But you're asking, okay, it's not full. What do I do now in my relationship with the kids and in, in my relationship with the family? I was thinking about this today because I sense, I could be wrong about this, that among younger people today who've grown up in the church and had a lot of legalism in their background as they see it, they are solving the problem of legalism by throwing out the disciplines of Bible reading and prayer and family devotions. And this question 
might be answered by saying, look, if your tank is empty, then if you try to lead your family in devotions and sing a song and pray with them, it will be so formalistic and so mechanical and so coerced by your sense of duty that you will do more harm than good, so skip it tonight. I think that's a very common approach. And you know what usually happens? Skipping spiritual disciplines, your own or family, doesn't make the glory fall so that you can come back with glorious spontaneity. It becomes habitual. And now you're skipping it two, three, four times a week in the name of Christian freedom. And then the power starts to go in you and the family. So what is the answer? The answer isn't hypocrisy. Kids know this. Okay, just, just, just be real honest. Kids know hypocrisy. I think you gather the family and you just tell them how you feel. Dad is really tired and, uh, you know, you got an 8-year-old, you got a 12-year-old, got a 5-year-old, got a 16-year-old maybe, uh, and a wife who's patient with you. And I'm, I'm talking the man here because I think men have this main responsibility, not that single moms don't or that women don't if they're guys a slacker, but mainly men should do this. Um, and, and he should just say, make it a teaching moment and say to, to the, it'll pick out a, a child and say, you know, sometimes you don't love Jesus like you ought to, do you? You don't feel like doing what's right, you don't want to go to church or don't feel like going to school. I kind of feel like that right now. It'll shock the pants off your kids. Socks, maybe socks. <laughs> and, then, and then you just help them and say, you know, we could skip it, but that, that wouldn't be more real, would it, kids? Wouldn't it be better just for all of us to pray? And, and let's, read, let's read a text about the grace of God, and, uh, and you pray for me, and I'll pray for you. Something like that. You can't do that every night for a year. <laughs> but you probably can do it more often than you think you can. And my guess is that's what the kids will remember when they go off to college. And you teach them over time that my, my analogy is if you, if you want a fire in the camp to cook, you know, marshmallows on, hot dogs and hamburgers, s'mores, um, if you want a fire and it's going out, um, leaving it untended isn't the answer. Like, whoa, she'll hope we have a fire someday. <laughs> Put the little sticks on, the little sticks. Big sticks, they don't burn till it's hot, right? Put the little sticks on. <sighs> Bro, <sighs> tend the fire. That's, that's what that gathering would be. It's just in, we don't have big sticks. We have some little sticks. The little sticks is this verse. We might ordinarily read a chapter. We're reading a verse tonight. And we're just laying hold on that little stick that God would set it on fire and maybe the next night it'll burn a little hotter. And One more. Maybe Tony got another one. And then we'll keep going. How are we doing? We've got half hour if we survive. Could you expound further on the relationship between our union with Christ and our personal holiness. That's a, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that was asked because I want to make sure that the nature of the influence of union with Christ in justification and the nature of the influence of union with Christ in sanctification are not confused because they're not the same. Okay? So here we go. When you are born again and the wind blows where it wills, and the Christ that you have found boring and unbelievable and mythological suddenly shines with self-evidencing glory and beauty, and you say yes to him and believe him and embrace him and entrust him, that's the Holy Spirit uniting you to Christ. Okay? 
I said that the way I wanted to say it. That is the Holy Spirit uniting. It's like, like the un- union comes later. Look, I do this first, then I get union. The, the union is as you go in, it's the Holy Spirit moving you and your will in, and as soon as you're there, there's life. He is where life is. Union with, you don't get life and then you get united. You don't get united and then 10 minutes later get life. Union, when, when, the, when you're in the vine, the sap is flowing. You, you're, in the, you're, in li- you're in union with Christ. Now, two things happen. They're not the same. The one is God looks upon you in union with Christ as Christ. My son's righteousness is yours. My son's perfection is yours. My son's obedience is yours. That's called justification. And it's by faith alone, apart from any whimper of a work. Faith is not a work. Faith is a receiving. I receive him. I love him. I enjoy him. I, he's, I'm just taking him in like a fountain. Just drink, drink, drink. This is not a work. This is a, a resting, an awakening of heart to the pleasure. If you're looking at an artwork and you feel nothing and then you see beauty, that wasn't a work. Your eyes were opened. It happened to you. And that's why faith is. So that's union and justification. That righteousness is counted as yours. Now, union with Christ is also living, metaphysical. That's probably not a helpful word. It has to do with the real daily you and the Holy Spirit is now in you and Christ is in you. Might be helpful to look at Romans 8. Um, uh, 8, 9, 8, 8, 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You are however, are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God is in you, in, in, let's add Jesus now. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him, but if Christ is in you, although your body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, if you analyze that out, union with Christ is also Christ in you, the Holy Spirit in you, which means union with Christ is the source of the power by which we are changed called sanctification. And the faith that unites us to Christ and lives in Christ is one faith. And the thesis of this course is that faith is un- it unites us with Christ for justification imputed and that faith unites us with Christ for sanctification imparted. Okay, we're gonna keep working on that for the next three and hours and 27 minutes. I think we'll stop with questions there and keep, keep going for a few more minutes. If I discern that you're just about done, I'll stop early. So flop over in your seat if you want to <laughs> stop early. Faith is profoundly and pervasively future-oriented. Um, this is one of the parts I, I uh, revised because there was a lot of confusion in what I was saying. So let me see if I can help be less confusing. Faith can look back and back and believe a truth about the past, like Christ died for my sins. So please don't, when I say faith in future grace, don't hear me as negating that. Faith can look back and see Jesus in history dying and say, I believe that. You have to believe that. You're not saved if you don't believe that. That's past. 
glorious, foundational grace, and if you deny it, don't believe it, don't receive it, then, then you're not a Christian. And faith can look out, so back and out, and trust a person, like a personal receiving of Christ. So at any given moment in an unbeliever's life, that unbeliever can, when he hears the gospel, look out of himself and in the gospel say yes and receive him now. And that's an act of faith in the now, in the, in the experienced moment of the present, I say yes now to Jesus. So faith in future grace doesn't deny that. And faith can look forward and be assured about a promise, like I'll be with you to the end. And that's what I'm stressing. There's a promise. He won't let me fall. He'll keep me to the end. But now watch this. Profoundly and pervasively, those words were not in edition number one. I think I had um, mainly. And you say, well, why are you, why are you picking profoundly and pervasively future in? Here comes why. But even when faith embraces a past reality, its saving essence includes the embrace of the implications of that reality for the present and the future. I'm going to argue that if you look back at the death of Jesus and say, I believe he died for my sins, and there is no believing in the implications of that for the now and the morrow, you're not saved. Where would you go for that in the Bible? Right here. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, past, much more now that we are reconciled, present, are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life, future. Now I'm arguing that even when you are most self-consciously past looking, looking back at the glorious work of Christ on the cross to reconcile you, you are believing this and this, or you're not believing. You've just turned it into a past, meaningless, historical anecdote. If that death does not mean now I'm reconciled, tomorrow I'll be reconciled, it's worthless. So, I'm sticking with my uh, pervasively. So, when I say pervasively, I mean when you look back, it's future-oriented, and now I'm going to argue when you look out. Thus, when faith looks back and embraces the death of his son, it also embraces the reconciliation of the present and the future. And when faith looks out and trusts Christ in the present, its saving essence consists in being satisfied with him now and forever. Okay, now why do I think that? John 6, 35. Whoever comes to me, comes present, shall not hunger, future. Whoever believes in me, present, shall never thirst, future. What does that mean? That means that if in any given moment you are coming to Jesus to drink, and if in any given moment you are believing in Jesus as satisfying bread, part of the conviction of coming and part of the conviction of believing is that he keeps satisfying forever because that's what it says. If you say, I am coming now to Jesus 
as an all-satisfying fountain. I am believing now in Jesus as all-satisfying spiritual bread, but I have no idea whether he will be there in five hours and whether he will be Lord and Savior and treasure and bread and water for my life. And I have no idea whether the future uh, a thousand years out will be satisfying. You don't have saving faith. Saving faith is not about the next five minutes alone. It's not about the next minute alone. It's about (laughs) he is who he says he is forever. And so I repeat, he is, faith is past, present, or future, pervasively future-oriented. Text to show the future-oriented faith. This one we've seen, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. That's pretty clear. I love this one. Abraham did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which is as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. So he did not, he did not weaken in faith. Why not? I mean, what do you mean he didn't weaken in faith? I mean, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise. That's what faith was for Abraham. But he grew strong in his faith in the promise and gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. So as a model of justifying faith, Abraham believes the promise of God. Faith is future-oriented. John 14, 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. What kind of belief is that? Well, what are you troubled about? You're troubled about tomorrow or five minutes from now or the cancer diagnosis. You got the appointment for the the read of the spot on your lung in three days. That's what you're troubled about. Well, if that's what you're troubled about and he says, believe in God, what does he mean? I believe he was there in the past and it has nothing to do with the next three days? No. He means trust him. He's going to take care of you in these days. That's what it means. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9, we don't not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. We were utterly, so utterly burdened beyond our strength. We despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Why? Why had God appointed that kind of despair and suffering and danger? But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Now think, Paul has been brought up to the edge of life and despairs of life. He's trapped, perhaps, in Damascus. There's no way out. There's murderous mobs outside this house, and I'm gone. It's over. Or it could have been more emotional than that. Maybe he was sick, or maybe he was depressed, or maybe, maybe everybody had abandoned him, or whatever. We don't know what the situation was. And clearly, this was of God. And the reason I say it's clear is because Satan does not have this design. Right? There. That's not Satan's design. And it wasn't Paul's design. It's God's design. So the design in this moment of despair is that you may win, rely on the God who raises the dead. That's in the future. You see? This is what I'm so I'm seeing over and over again in the Bible. What does God want from me right now in this moment when I'm just ready to die? He wants you to believe in the resurrection and be happy about it. That's future grace. He wants you to be sustained right now in prison or in despair or in family crisis or in relational breakdown or in cancer. He wants you to be sustained by, I'm going to be raised from the dead. I read, I'm reading the Gospel of John for my devotions. I just read for the third time this morning. And I will raise him from the dead. 
I underlined it all three times. I will raise him from the dead. Nobody comes to the Father but by me, and I will raise him from the dead. And God used it. I'm going to raise you from the dead. Anything else that happens is, you know, that's going to happen. So we can make it. That's future grace, and he wanted Paul to rely on it. Conclusion about the future orientation of faith. Saving faith is profoundly and pervasively future-oriented. There is no saving act of faith, whether looking back in history to history or out to a person or forward to a promise that does not include a future orientation. That's a pretty sweeping claim. You should think about it before you embrace it. Because if it's true, it lends a lot of weight to how we live the Christian life. Why does faith have such power to transform such that when you have it, you cannot but be sanctified? And the answer, I'm arguing, is that it always is embracing all that God is for you in Jesus from this second on. And the promises are spectacular. Like in the short run, all things will work together for your good. And in the long run, do you know what you inherit? Why do you boast about men? I'm of Paulus. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Cephas or the world or life or death, All things are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. So stop bragging about your car, or your house, or your teacher. You own the world. Isn't that an interesting way to argue against pride? (laughs) Boasting. Why, why do people boast in their teachers? Or why do people boast in their churches? Or why do people boast in their jobs? It's because they're weak. That's why. They're fearful. They're insecure. They they're, want their ego stroked by somebody praising them. You know the people who don't need to do that? People who in about an hour will inherit the universe. I mean, you remember that story from John Newton? I love the story. You've heard it. I'll tell it again because I love it. He told it about a man going to New York to inherit a million dollars. This was 200 years ago. Is that right? 200, roughly. So he's he's from England, but he's telling this story about a man going to New York in his carriage. I'm going to get a million dollars. A million dollars in those days would have been, you know, 100 million today. So he's going to inherit a million dollars. And the wheel falls off his carriage. And he's one mile from New York. Right? And he gets down and he looks and he walks all the way to New York one mile grumbling the whole way my carriage is broken my carriage is broken (laughs) that's the Christian life of a grumbler that's stupid (laughs) you're going to You're on your way to get a hundred million (laughs) dollars. Have you ever thought about your life that way? I feel like a fool. I mean, every day. I'm a fool every day. Why can't I wake up? Profoundly future-oriented. And the power of believing that We're going to see tomorrow when we get into its power to love, its power to kill lust, its power to kill impatience. This is it. That future glory is the solution to conquering your failures of love and your sin. Therefore, faith banks 
faith banks on the future that God promises and thus breaks the power of sin which lures us with the deceitful promise of a happier future. I think I'll take these two verses and we're probably going to quit, okay? Let me see. Yeah, I'm going to go four verses and then stop. Faith is, is being satisfied with all the promises God promises to be for us. That's, it's a huge premise in this seminar. So make sure you, you see reasons for believing it, not just because I told you. I'm arguing that the, the nature of saving faith is not simply believing facts about Jesus' past, present, or future, but embracing him, receiving him, and treasuring him as all that God promises to be for us and being satisfied in him. It has a very big affectional dimension, not just a notional dimension or rational dimension. So here is a couple of verses that point in that direction. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now the parallel is coming is parallel to believing and not hungering is parallel to not thirsting. So these are two pictures of trusting Christ. Trusting Christ is believing in Him and receiving Him as water for the soul, and trusting Him is coming to Him as bread for the soul. These are all spiritual images of soul hunger, and we are satisfied. I'm reading an article right now in First Things called Acedia and Pornography. Very powerful article. I'm waiting for the electronic version to be public, and then I'm going to tweet a connection to it. And, and the argument is, acedia is the old sin of spiritual apathy or boredom. And this, the thesis of this article is, pornography is rampant because spiritual apathy is rampant. There, there are very few people who are so thrilled and taken with spiritual things and the power and the beauty and the glory and the wisdom and the majesty of God that their lives are basically drab and boring, and therefore the rush has power. We live so low spiritually. We live so low. The tide has gone so far out in the church and in many lives that when along comes a razzle-dazzle nudity, nothing can stand against it. This says faith is coming to Christ to be satisfied in Him in our souls. That's what that teaches. Look at this one, John 7, 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, and who doesn't? The human soul is a desire factory. All we do is thirst. Let him come and drink. Yes, Jesus comes into the world, a world of craving people and says, come drink. Whoever believes, there's the faith piece, whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So I think coming and believing there are parallel realities just like they were in verse 30. Five. And so both of those texts argue that in the Gospel of John, in the mouth of Jesus, saving faith is a coming to Jesus for satisfaction and finding it. Two more, and then we'll be done. I think it's two. First John 5, 3, and 4. This is love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Huh. So loving God means keeping his commandments. No, no, no. The Pharisee Paul said, as to the law, I was blameless. As to zeal, I persecuted the church. As to righteousness under, as to, as to law, Pharisee, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. No, 
The love of God is that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome because he's just so satisfying. Freedom is doing what you want to do and not regretting it in a thousand years. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. Oh, 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 so when you're born again, a change happens so that you don't find the commandments burdensome anymore, but a delight to know him, to love him, to follow him is a delight because the new birth changed that. Now, we just need to add one more piece. Faith overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Whoa, I thought it was the new birth that overcame the world. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. The new birth overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. So do you see why I said faith as an agent is the channeling, it's the, it's the, it's the, um, the wire through which the current of the, of the new birth power flows. So you got, when you got saved, you plugged in to Christ. And the current goes, shoo, just right through the faith. It, it's, there's no hesitation. There's no delay whatsoever. You plugged in, power's going. A light goes on. Let your light so shine before men that they may see you're plugged in. The light doesn't make you plug in. It's because you're plugged in. The light didn't plug you in. New birth is the key to overcoming the world. What's the world here? What's the world? The world is burdensome commands. The, the world is a heart that finds the commands burdensome. I'm a worldly person if I come to the Bible and say, oh, 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 oh. That's a worldly heart. <laughs> to come to the Bible and say, more, 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 that's a new birth heart. This is serious. This is serious. Christianity is a miracle, it's not a decision. It's a miracle, it's called the new birth. And the first cry of the newborn baby is faith. Therefore, faith includes, faith includes love for God, because that's what it says there. Love for God in the sense of valuing him and treasuring him above all else. So faith is a being satisfied in all that God is and promises to be for us. And because it's satisfying, we don't find his words burdensome anymore. Therefore, faith severs the root of sin, which is the promise sin makes for a better future and a better satisfaction. We'll see a lot of illustrations of that tomorrow, but we are done with three minutes to go, and I'm gonna take one of those to pray. Father, I pray in heaven that, I pray in your name that your name would be hallowed and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven and that grace would come on us tonight, me for finishing a sermon and these folks for doing what they need to do with you and with each other and with folks back home that they might need to reckon with. So refresh us, give us the energy and the spiritual readiness for tomorrow, I pray, and glorify your name in it all. Through Christ, I pray. Amen.